The following bout is scheduled for one fall. Wrestling could exist outside of the WWE, which had ran opposed, uh, unopposed, excuse me, for about two decades. Nice to see that it was able to, uh, that, that, that that wrestling could, ex could exist outside of that bubble that was still strong and there was still a very, very pronounced uh, taste for it. But yet there is a sense of hope and optimism that this time, these guys have the answers. For nearly 20 years, World Wrestling Entertainment has stood alone at the top of the American professional wrestling market. While competitors exist, they have failed to reach the multi-billion dollar commercial success of the WWE. But one offhand comment in 2017 would serve to fundamentally alter the professional wrestling landscape. In May of 2017, Dave Meltzer, elder scholar of the professional wrestling press corps, was asked if promotion Ring of Honor could ever sell 10,000 tickets to a live event, to which he responded, not anytime soon. Former WWE superstar and current ROH roster member Cody Rhodes said he'd take that bet. Working with his Bullet Club stablemates, the Young Bucks, Cody Rhodes began to build an indie wrestling supercard called All In, including modern professional wrestling standouts Ray Phoenix, Kazuchika Okada, Jay Lethal, Tessa Blanchard, Rey Mysterio, and Kenny Omega, who is widely considered to be one of the, if not the, greatest wrestlers of the modern era. When All In, the pay-per-view, was hit, uh, there was undeniable excitement from top to bottom. And I think you really had to be a die-hard, absolute die-hard uh, WWE fan to not find any kind of uh, thrill or enjoyment in this. The show was held at the Sears Center Arena in suburban Chicago on September 1st, 2018 and sold 11,000 tickets, gained more than 50,000 pay-per-view buys and, despite some significant timing issues near the end, Sports Illustrated called the event a near-perfect pay-per-view debut. And Dave Meltzer quipped, he was happy to lose the bet. Commercially, set the table. It proved that there was, there was an audience for this which frankly wasn't a sure thing. For the last two decades before that, there was a whole lot of evidence it wasn't. There wasn't an audience for that. So it's, you know, it's the centerpiece almost of the promotion. Meanwhile, the co-owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars and English Premier League side Fulham FC, Tony Khan, had been working on a passion project of his own. From his youngest days, Tony had been an avid fan of professional wrestling and now found himself in a place to do something about it. Who is Tony Khan? Never, no one really knew who was Tony Khan. Well, at least, you know, when I say no one, I mean no one really in the wrestling business. His energy is infectious to some, irritating to others. You could brand him as a money mark or a creative genius. All of this stuff was thrown out before he even run a show. Khan is friends with then president of TNT and TBS Kevin Riley and began talks with him about a possible return of wrestling to TNT a product absent from the brand since the end of the Monday Night Wars in 2001 with the purchase of World Championship Wrestling by WWE. Working together first with the Young Bucks, then with Cody Rhodes and Kenny Omega, Khan founded All Elite Wrestling with himself as the president and the other four as executive vice presidents. The deal was made official in an announcement on January 1, 2019 and a press conference on January 8th that included the signing of WWE superstar Chris Jericho, and soon thereafter, Jim Ross, the voice of the WWE during the Attitude Era and the years after. Jericho signing with AEW was a huge deal. It was a tremendously big deal. If only to continue on the energy that All In had created, that wrestling could exist outside the Fed. Then, on May 15th, AEW announced that they had signed a deal with Warner Media for a new wrestling program called Dynamite to air in the United States and Canada on Wednesday nights on TNT. This announcement catapulted AEW into the limelight, with many seeing it as the first credible competitor to WWE in nearly two decades. 
This was their shot at cutting this thing off before it started. And it was, in doing so, I think it oddly galvanized the people that were interested in AEW in a sense that, oh, we are actually on their on their radar here. Now, this isn't a case of we're doing our own thing. Now, this is going to be competition whether we want it to be or not. In 2012, the WWE show NXT was relaunched as a showcase for developmental talent on the WWE Network. The show launched the careers of wrestling standouts like Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, Seth Rollins, AEW's own Pack, and more, and was widely considered to be the best pure wrestling show in America, with its takeover pay-per-views appointment viewing for the wrestling faithful. Even though the show was technically WWE's developmental brand and was shown only on the Fed's subscription service, the WWE Network, under the leadership of Paul Levesque, known in the wrestling world as Triple H, NXT had outgrown those expectations and, on August 19th, four months after the announcement that AEW Dynamite would premiere on TNT in October, WWE announced that NXT would launch on the USA Network on Wednesday nights, opposite AEW. NXT launched on September 19th, two weeks before AEW, in what could only be an attempt to capture viewers before the competitors' premiere. The show debuted to 1.1 million viewers and a .43 share of the all-important 18-49-year-old television viewing audience. Two weeks later, AEW, on their premiere show, captured 500,000 more viewers than NXT, with an average 1.4 million viewers to NXT's 891,000 viewers. I think we will all remember the Wednesday Night War most for that very first week where AEW came out as hot as they did. And I think that set the tone. And, and I think what it really showed is the audience that's watching the Wednesday shows is clued in in a way that made the actual move itself seem rather hollow and transparent. And I think there are a lot of people that were encouraged to kind of dismiss NXT because it was so obvious they were being used as a battering ram, so to speak, for another brand. AEW was a critical hit, but it didn't receive universal praise, and its ratings did decline in the subsequent months. The promotion was now forced to exist in a narrative of direct competition with NXT. AEW hit an early nadir, with two angles that played out in the waning months of 2019 being widely panned by fans and critics, The Nightmare Collective and The Dark Order. Two generally outlandish stories played far too seriously for their subject matter. Coupled with a weak and meandering women's division, the end of 2019 signaled the need for change. So when AEW started in 2019, it's really safe to say that the I mean, the honeymoon period was really, really rocky. <laughs> it, uh, the marriage didn't start off all that great. Uh, yeah, the first few shows were super compelling, but AEW towards the last few months of 2019 was not great. Brandy's Nightmare Collective. Anyone who remembers watching that, you don't need me to walk you through it. It was terrible. What did they do? They axed it. Tony Khan had run a generally open shop when it came to creating angles up until this point. But after the last show of 2019 was so negatively received, he stepped in and began to assert more direct control over the promotion, ending the Nightmare Collective story and revamping the Dark Order. These changes, plus a number of other tweaks, led AEW into what is considered one of the strongest runs of the young promotion's life in the months leading up to the Revolution 2020 pay-per-view. This period set up key conflicts, and stories began to have more stakes. The Revolution pay-per-view was a hit, and was voted best pay-per-view of 2020 by the Wrestling Observer, with its tag team title bout, the culmination of a slowly simmering, multi-layered feud between the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Adam Page capturing top honors for tag team match. But just as momentum was starting to shift, the COVID-19 pandemic shut everything down. I wouldn't have want to run a wrestling promotion in 2020 in the midst of the most severe global pandemic we've seen in uh, the past couple of centuries. I don't know how AEW really managed to stay afloat or do their best. Crowds are a key component to every wrestling show, and their loss in this empty arena era was felt acutely by all involved in the sport. 
I think it would have taken a lot of optimism to when the pandemic started and the industry tried to adjust to view it as anything other than like a destroyer for AEW's building. You know, the momentum was on their side and all of a sudden they're stuck in the empty Daily's place. Then they're in, you know, a tiny little warehouse filming TV. And my own interest, I can tell you, dwindled. I, you know, I kind of feared the end for that, for that promotion. Um, and now you fast forward a year and I think it's been truly remarkable what they've done as a product. Between COVID-19, the unrest of the summer, and a raucous election season, ratings across the board for professional wrestling took a hit, and AEW found a new equilibrium with a smaller but steady audience. Throughout the summer of 2020, NXT and AEW stayed close to each other in the ratings, but by the end of July, AEW had pulled away and has seen the larger head-to-head -head audience every week since mid-July. Now that the COVID-19 pandemic seems to be on the retreat, AEW has begun to see some growth in its audience again. Rumors now abound that NXT may move to Tuesday nights. For many, this is the best possible outcome, as more wrestling on more nights means more eyes on the product divorced from necessary but regrettable story moves that dominated the competition era. The future of AEW is good. It, 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 it galvanizes its fan base, it ignites it as, as well, and it will continue to maintain it. With a five-year deal locked in, NXT apparently on the move, and two new shows on the way, including a one-hour cable TV program, the future looks bright for the young promotion. While flawed, that word is the one I keep coming back to, AEW Optimus. It's a promotion built on you believing they're going to give you what you want in the end. And I think as long as they keep that, it's hard for me to be anything but optimistic about their future. But the wrestling world is nothing if not jaded and a little fickle, and so watches with interest, wondering will AEW truly grow to the heights they seem to be capable of, or will they fall by the wayside like promotions past? Only time will tell. I love you, baby, but you can't talk into the microphone.